This is insanity that I'm not, this is absolute insanity I'm not fishing. But also, I can already tell you from swimming here in the summertime, the best runs are on the far side of this run right here. There's a bunch of dead trees in the bottom middle right there. Otherwise I would be casting from right here. And then the river's so high just around the, the bend where I videotaped all those bears and the boulders and the shoreline. Well, that's all ripping right now. And a little too risky to try to wade out into that current. So I gotta bring my, I gotta blow up a inflatable I wanna bring down here so I can get across the river and I can hike up that side of the bank and fish this place properly. So if any of you anglers are wondering why I'm not just taking a couple casts, that's why. <laughs> I can't even cast my camera from here. I could, but it's not that easy. The best. Obviously, it's every time. The best is on the other side of the river, right? Every time. I don't get it. But anyway, let's see. We got more voices to be heard. What do we got? By the time you guys are listening to this, I'm probably loading hay into my horse trailer. All right. This is titled Camp Lejeune. Mark is red. I think what happens with a lot of these duplicates is when people send in their emails to me, and then they send them into the other email address, and then they send them in again a month later, and then I'm always in a rush, and I see one in the email, I see it's an experience, and I copy and paste it, put it in the notes, and then all of a sudden, boom, they get in there twice. That sucks. Total Camp Lejeune. I saw the vids when you talked about Camp Lejeune in the winter of 20, 2011 and 2012. I was a taxi driver that had a base permit. I would work the topless bars in town. I would get fares at 2 or 3 a.m. that sometimes have to go to Courthouse Bay. That's where Recon and some MOS students were stationed at. There was two clubs that were by the air station and it was cheaper to go in the back gate at Sheeds Ferry to go to the bay. One night I picked four Recon guys and went the back way. I had all the guys awake to go through the gate as you have to show their IDs. Got about two miles past the gate when me and the guy in the front seat saw a large upright being run across the road from an LZ area to the woods in two steps. I asked the guy beside me, did you see that? He said yes and then told me it's not the first time and said they were told not to talk about them from higher ups. The other clubs in town you had to go in for the into you had to go in the main gate, then go down Sheeds Ferry Road and take a right on Marine Road to get to the bay. The cabbies call it Five Mile Road or Suicide Alley as there could be from two to three hundred deer eating grass right on the side of the road. Pick a fair one night and go to the guys and got the guys past the gate and three guys in the back seat, pass out again. Made the right on Five Mile Road. Yes, it's five miles long. It was coming up in the first curve when me and the guy in the seat beside me saw about a eight foot being holding a deer in its right arm by its back legs. It dropped the deer and run up the small hill into the woods. I stopped and looked at the deer. Its neck had been broken. Well, the guy in the front seat told me he had been on fire watch the week before and was on third level of the barrack when he saw one chase a deer across the compound. Well, I dropped them off and went back to the spot and the deer was gone. Well, a few weeks later, we had a northeaster go up the coast and it dumped six inches of snow on the beach and in town. A buddy of mine called me and told me the city buses could not run to the bay because of the ice in the road. So I went to the back of the mall, found four guys that were waiting on the 1 a.m. bus. The bus pulled up and the driver told them he couldn't take them, so they jumped in with me. The road was not bad until I turned on Five Mile Road. It had been a wet, heavy snow that froze into a sheet of ice. It took 20 minutes to make the five miles to the bay, dropped the guys off as making my way back when the clouds broke and the full moon shone. Got about the end of Five Mile Road when I saw about a nine-footer run across the road into the small stand of trees. I stopped the car, got out, and watched it tree peak for about two minutes before it ran down the dirt road beside the tree stand of trees. A few weeks later, I, a few weeks later, I stop cab. I stop cab driving and go. Oh, I stopped cab driving. I'm guessing and got my CDLs again to drive truck. I was 
home one weekend in September while my truck was being worked on when I had a stroke. And the next day, had one that almost killed me. Yikes. In May, my buddy talked me into, talked me into driving cab again after I passed a driver test to prove I could drive again since the state pulled my CDLs after the strokes. Well, I was surprised the first time going down five mile, the base had cleared and the trees and brush fit. Oh, sorry. Well, I was surprised. The first time going down five mile, the base had cleared the trees and brush 50 feet on both sides of the road. And the four buildings had 10 feet, 10 foot chain link fence with razor wire on top. End of story. Camp Lejeune, you guys, all right? Bill, thanks for that email, man. I absolutely appreciate that. That must have been something else to see those things that, that many times. But even more so to have your passengers talk flat out, matter of fact, about them too, right? Which wasn't overly surprising for me at this point, but it must be for, for your average person who hasn't seen or, or learned too much about these things. And then you got to see one, and then your passenger says, yeah, we see them all the time. I'm still half-assed waiting for one to just blatantly stand out here behind us on the side of that river. I got a funny feeling it might happen one of these times. Thanks, for sending that in. Thanks again for sending that email in. We appreciate it. Okay, here we go. Mark this one as red. Here's a different title. Human Baby Observation on Sabbath. Hi Steve, first thank you for the contribution to humanity. It is a giant part of my life moving forward in our current times. Share it all if you wish. This email is possible puzzle piece to whomever may feel is relevant. I'll keep it short. My eight month baby is half Canadian. <laughs> I'm a New Zealander and returned to New Zealand during COVID pregnant. I feel the Pacific Northwest of BC is more home to me than my birth country. It's a sad to go. I had many supernatural experiences in a short few years on Vancouver Island and BC under the panhandle of Alaska, Prince Rupert, Terrace, Nass Valley, etc. Getting to the point. My daughter, as many babies, find most noises intriguing or comical. Growls, hisses, angry animal calls are hilarious to her, especially if I am vocalizing them myself to her. Yet, when she hears me whoop from low ending high, it freaks her out. She's with me 24 seven, being too young to be anywhere else, and I can say this is the only sound she is nervous about. If I touch her arm while whooping, she jumps. I can see the fear in her eyes and panic all over her face and body. She freezes. She is freaked the hell out, eyes wide, just total fear. Nothing makes her react that this way except this whoop call. I hate to see her cry. When she cries from this, it's like she's even too fearful to cry. So there are more whimpers and broken vocal attempts. What the hell? It totally breaks my heart. She loves dogs, all animals, including ostrich and cows. She is quite exposed to animals. Very social, smiles and sings out to everyone in the street. Not a scary to cat type of kid. I've given her siren noises, just the top notes, the ending of whoops. No negative reaction. The low beginning of a whoop. She enjoys it and smiles and rocks as if it's a tune. No negative reaction. Without coming off like I abused my kid, purposely testing her reaction, I've done it a few times after I noticed her freak out to a whoop on a video I was watching. Won't be doing any more of it. I do not enjoy making my baby pet. My, my uneducated opinion. Her DNA knows. Or her memory, being so young, still tied to the side, having freshly come through. I can only speculate on these. I don't know if that helps someone or if others find this. She is eight months old, but this observation speaks volumes to me when I see this baby who in her life with me has not experienced firsthand the Sabe call. Is it in hers and all of our DNA like an imprint memory to fear this sound like cats with cucumbers, even if that particular cat lives nowhere near any snakes? I self-study neuroscience, psychology, and all those lovely relevant topics such as our pa pandemic, cryptids, ancient architecture, and the supernatural. The concepts of all these topics are showing more and more links to one another. One another, very excited to see how it all ends, or maybe begins is a better way of putting it. A new age for many that will survive this. By the way, NZ has its own version of Sabe, 
less experiences here. We have a few magical things going on, but nothing like BC. A slightly political thank you rant below. Thanks for listening to me. I don't think anyone would take me seriously if I spoke up, which is why I stick to myself. The Southern Hemisphere has gone bonkers, by the way. You're lucky to be in BC. Here in New Zealand, there is nowhere to hide. I fear eventually we will be weeded out and put through the system. New Zealand is and always has been a controlled lab for population experiments, especially those of technology. I made a mistake flying here thinking it was a safe place to give birth. I flew straight into the devil's playground. They are successfully testing communism here. Most of the country is happily obliging, not much resistance. And even if there was, they de-armed the whole country just a few years ago. All part of the grand scheme. Keep your eyes on New Zealand if you want to see the Western world's future. I have no doubt we'll be the first to fry. Enjoy what time I have left. Enjoying what time I have left with my daughter, Sylvia, New Zealand. Sylvia, thanks for that. I got a lot of Kiwi friends, obviously. You, if you're in BC being a Kiwi yourself, you, you guaranteed you went up to Whistler quite a bit. And there's a lot of Kiwis in Whistler and Aussies, to tell you what. And uh, there's a lot of very A type people that I know in New Zealand, and, and uh, I can assure you they're not the type to comply. I think everywhere the shit show is flying, there's a lot of people, brave people out there, who just wait. They're sitting back, observing, and waiting, and talking about themselves. But backing up on what you just emailed, um, so you guys understand. A handful of years ago, I caught something online by accident on YouTube. And it might have been YouTube, I don't know, it's somewhere. And it was a documentary on psychology. And they were more speaking directly about the proof available to show that what the mother has experienced in her lifetime is passed through to her offspring. They proved it. And and I find this very, very interesting myself. I'd like to look into a lot of it if I could, a lot more of it when I get time. But what I found interesting was for me, when I teach people how to hunt, be more successful in learning about game and habits and their minds and how they react and remember and what they do to survive. What they did to prove that experiences are passed down through the generations through the womb, they used the red stags of Germany as an example. And the example was, when the Great Wall was up between, you know, the free and the not so free, you know, it was a concrete wall, whereas more of a population, then once it, once it went rural, there was a high electric smoking hot fence going all the way through the forest as that extension of the Great Wall, right? And they, when the, the Great Wall came down, I think that was during the Reagan, wasn't it during the Reagan administration is when that went down? But anyway. The electric fence in the forest came down, but I think they said it was five or six generations of red deer passed, the deer still stayed away from where that hot fence used to be. Go figure, right? So the deer that were alive when that fence was up and hot, they had all passed away a you know, handful of generations ago. And uh, the uh, but they still knew. They still knew to. They still knew how to, and that they should possibly avoid that area. Interesting, isn't it? And then they went on, and that was the. I remember the part that triggered in my mind because I was very interested in how the deer, how those, how the game animals reacted. So, um, which made a lot more sense later on, heavily hunted areas and how deer react and and live and on and on. But anyway, getting back to the human thing, what you discovered, I would. I absolutely, I've been thinking this all along. One thing for sure is I believe our true natural skills that we used to have have been intentionally er eradicated almost from us. I shouldn't say eradicated, but suppressed. And um, yeah, I wouldn't suggest scaring the shit out of your baby anymore, the whoops, right? But that is very interesting. I haven't heard anybody email in that yet about having the whooping sound um, triggering natural terror in a, in a brand new human baby. And I'll guarantee you somebody out there is going to go try it right now, right? After hearing you mention it here today. It's very interesting. And uh, keep your head up down there. Enjoy life. 
I, I, I have always firmly believed that good wins over evil. Always. Just sadly, a lot of people will pass on before they get to experience that the the, uh, the winning part. Um, I got a story to share with you guys one day. I don't share much personal shit about me. I've been threatening to a few times so you can understand me and, and, and understand why I stand the way I do and why I want to fight the way I do. And uh, you'll understand me a lot more when I share to you what's happened to me in my lifetime. And uh, I, was, I was put in a situation at one time where everything was against me. Everything. I was possibly going to go to prison. For, they wanted me to go put these people who didn't know who I am and didn't know what really happened, wanted to put me in a cage. And everything was up against me and there was no way out. And, uh, but in my mind, in my heart and soul, I knew that it was a classic case of good against evil and good's going to win. I'm going to be fine. And that's luckily how it went. But I was 100%. In my mind and soul, I knew I was going to win. I knew it was just good against evil in the end, no matter how how bad the odds were stacked up. So why I'm telling you that today is, Sylvia, is to keep your head up. Good wins over evil. It does. And, and it will. Anyway. I'm talking to everybody crazy. See any fish rise? Seen any uh, humanoids popping their heads out behind me yet? I'm almost froze, but not quite. Let me see if I can get another one. I don't even know how long that camera's been going this time. It seems like a bit down here for half the day. I hate it when the phone shuts off all the time. Draws me bonks. Right, here we go. How long is this one? That's a fair distance. Well, let's see. They gotta be heard. Let's go. Marked as red. This is titled, His Rational Mind Would Not Let Him Say What He Saw. I hope this helps someone. Dear Steve, straight to the point. Jonathan Bordelon. Bordelon, again. So I'm in Colorado, probably six years ago, guiding elk hunters. As usual, walking up to feed horses early, letting them eat, and then saddling up horses and saw bucks on horses to carry gear. Like always, I would take them a couple miles out of camp and then drop them off anywhere from a half a mile to a mile apart. Then I would sit and wait about a half a mile from them. You know, waiting on that gunshot. Being that the terrain can be pretty rough and some places can be flat out dangerous. I usually leave with the hunters right before daylight to get them out there. And try to get them back to where we'll be pulling into camp right at dark. Anyway, this particular week I had six to eight hunters in camp. All of them are related, three generations, grandfathers, father, and grandsons. They all appeared to be pilots, every one of them for Southwest Airlines, which I thought was pretty cool. I tell you all that to tell you this. The last hunter I dropped off was one of the older sons of the grandfather. Is it getting time for me to come back I pick up my hunters and head back to camp, which I did to no prevail. When I got to my hunter, the first one to be picked up, he was overlooking a four or five hundred yard beautiful bluff of flowering yellow grass, surrounded by some small ridges at about a thousand at about a thousand feet, full of dark timber and aspen trees. He looked very puzzled. I said, Are you okay? He said, Yes. But can I ask you a question? I said, Yes, of course. He asked if there were any people up here in the top of the mountains where we were. He said he saw a man about 400 yards to his left at the end of the bluff come up on a horse with a bright orange blanket on his horse. He tied the horse to a large tree at the end of the bluff, about 15 to 20 yards from the edge of the dark timber. I said, yes, that's not unusual. If you look down over the bluff and the edge of the cliff to see ranches down there, those people are more than welcome to come up on federal land and hunt for elk also. He said the man went into the dark timbers for a little while, probably two to three hours, came back out, got on his horse and left. I said, yep, that's not unusual. Then he said, okay, but something came out of the timber where he was shortly after he walked around that tree on two legs. When he said that, this, in my mind, I knew what it was. I tried to pull information out of him like you would not believe. I wanted him to say the word, and he would not. He said it walked on two legs around that tree and was absolutely huge. 
right where that man had his horse tied up. He went back into the dark timber and came out and did it again. This time putting his hand on the one big limb that came out of the tree just above his head. I told my hunter, here's your horse. I'll tie up the rest of them I had for the other hunters. Here's your horse. I will tie up the rest of them I had for the other hunters and let's ride over and take a look. He agreed. Immediately getting there, he was ready to leave. The, the limb was 10 to 11 feet up the tree and he kept saying whatever it was, that limb was just above its head. He kept saying, what do you think it was? I think he knew, but since he had never been taught with his highly intelligent mind that these things exist, his subconscious refused to believe it. I looked for tracks but could not see anything in the hard pressed ground, nor did I find any claw marks on the limb. He was very uncomfortable, so we started to head back and found and pick up the rest of his family. My hunters, he asked me to please not see anything to his family and made me promise. He was there for a week. His encounter was on his second day there. The rest of the week, he found a reason to sit with one of his family members. He refused to be out there by himself. I tried and tried to get him to say Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Harry Man, but he would not say anything of the sort. He refused to believe what he had saw. P.S. You gave me your address right before you moved. I wanted to send you something. Apparently, you have never received. It may be sitting at your old post office. If you don't get it soon, let me know, please, and I will send you another one. Thanks again, brother, for what you do. is helping people. And you know a bunch of us have your six. Send me your new address, if need be, so I can send you another package. God bless Jonathan Bordelin, fellow guide. Oh, shit. It doesn't sound, I don't think I received, I do not, I don't, I don't remember receiving anything, Jonathan. Um, I'm going to have to type in your name in the inbox of uh, my email and search you out, and I will get my, my email address to you, all right, man? And thanks for that. It's very generous and kind. It's funny, uh, side note, guide to guide, um, here in BC, it's kind of weird, it's weird for me, not weird, it's just not normal for me to hear of a guide dropping a hunter off and one guy taking that many hunters out and dropping them off along the way, leaving them by themselves. Because here, just for your, so for your knowledge, what we have to do in British Columbia, I mean, I can guide, I don't think there's a number cap on how many people I can take for the day. I mean, lots of outfitters up here commonly sell two on one hunts with two hunters and one guy. And um, I've never had three. I've got two people at once. But by law in BC, I have to be within eyesight and or earshot of my hunters at all times by law. So it's, it's odd to hear of, uh, of uh, you uh, dropping people off like that. And furthermore, I don't think where we guide up in the Northern Rockies where there's no people, man. I mean, we are in the middle of some outfits taking two days just to get the horses from road access through the mountains to get to the remote camp and then the bush plane. Bush plane comes and drops. Uh, different hunters every two weeks, right? So, usually, it doesn't matter how, t how A type a lot of these people are, they're usually all eyeballs <laughs> once they get dropped off as they all realizing, holy shit, we're in the middle of nowhere. You know, and, and uh, I don't think, I haven't come across too many hunters of mine that would, that would be too stoked on me dropping them off and saying, see you later, I'll come and get you later on. <laughs> Not too many would, although, I'd love it myself. But anyway, that should be enough babble for now. I'm gonna carry on up the road. And then I gotta go get my horse trailer out of the snow, get hooked up, get packed up, ready to go tomorrow. And there'll be more coming, more voices being heard. And if I could leave every, anyone on a note, it would be to please, 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 stop alienating people you have had as good, trustworthy friends, family, for years. Stop alienating them just because you are being urged to through a medical procedure. That's no excuse to not allow family members back into your home or friends. Okay, you guys? It's not. And, uh, there's, I do not understand how the government has figured out that power to make you divide 
from family members over a stupid injection. Even though they don't even have any kind of a virus or sickness at all. It's, it's really very weak and very sad. Please fight against it somehow. And for all you people who know what I'm talking about, let's please come up with a recipe to combat, combat that. All right, we've got to turn that shit around. I haven't heard of one medical voice anywhere who's addressing the public, one government voice anywhere addressing the public to urge all of us to stop alienating each other. They haven't. Have you noticed that? They're not urging us to not chop off people from our existence and separate and segregate because of a stupid needle. All right, let's try to figure out how to combat that and turn it around, all right? It's very, very, very important. Okay, I'll shut my mouth on that note. Talk to you guys later. Please, please, please share knowledge with each other and as many people as you can, no matter what their stance is on the topic, they're sharing the knowledge, okay? It's important, and it's important that everybody understands that we need to listen. Even though we may not agree, it is important that we, that we listen to each other and then take from it what you will or leave it. All right? It's very, very important. Be back again with more.